Hi, everybody. PJ Kwong here, otherwise known as At Skating PJ, with another episode of Blade This. I am joined by none other than my fabulous co host, Miss Charlene Bailey. Hey, Charlene, how are you today? I am well. How are you, PJ? I am well. Just another couple of days before we get out of this insane 2020. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our show today. We are so excited to have Ryan Stevens. Ryan yes. has been on the show before. He is maybe the best blogger that ever lived about figure skating. And we are going to talk a lot about figure skating in the Edwardian area. I'm going to put along the banner um, all of his social media information. But without further ado, because we've got lots to talk about, here he is, Ryan Stevens. Hey, Hello. Ryan. How happy are you? Christmas. Yes. Well, exactly. Happy New Year, whatever. <laughs> One of those happy. Let's get out of uh, let's get out of uh, 2020. How about I that? Can't I can't wait for this to be over. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. Listen, we have so many questions. You've written a new fantastic um, um, blog piece on the Edwardian area of skating. I'm going to put up all of your contact information for social media, including where people can find the blog, or as I called it, required reading <laughs> for today's episode. What about the Edwardian era really inspired you? Why were you so interested in that? Well, for starters, I love watching uh, period dramas, which I'm sure is a big shocker considering I write about history. But um, uh, <laughs> like everybody else, you know, I watched Downton Abbey. I watched um, Berkeley Square and the, du the Duchess of Duke Street and, you know, really fell in love with that time period. And I, I, think, I, I think that a lot of people seem to look at you know when they look back at skating history you know they're like may maybe it starts with sonia henny maybe it starts with barbara ann scott i wanted to go further back and kind of look at the beginnings of of the time when skating started to be taken more seriously as a sport rather than a pastime and that's what happened uh during this time period so it's super interesting the, and I want another question I have is how long does it take you to research? I mean, the blog with the photos and everything else is just um, remarkable. How long does it take to research and then to research the photos? So, you know, like normally when I do a blog, it, you know, it might take me, it, it might take me anywhere from an hour to, you know, five hours or something, something like this took, this is, this was kind of like a, uh, like a three month, um, project you know in the springtime when we were all during lockdown down this is what i this is what i did to keep myself you know <laughs> amused and then i shelved it for a while and then i came back to it because i always like to um you know kind of set things aside and then take a look at them uh through fresh eyes you know down the road and that's what i did with this one so yeah it took months <laughs> speaking of fresh eyes Here's somebody for you. Great to see Ryan from John Pepitoni. John, thank you so much for joining us. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you, where should we start with the pictures? Where should we start with the story? And Charlene's going to jump in as an outstanding um, uh, dress designer and figure skating coach. She's got lots to talk about too. Um, so where should we start? Well, um, why don't we start with um, with the picture? There, you, you had a really awesome picture of the um, of one of the skating rings. Okay. Time period. Yeah. So here, yeah. So on the left here, um, this is, I believe, Princess Skating Club. Yes, it is. So, yeah. So I started. Um, I kind of started the piece by talking about um, three different skating rinks, uh, indoor skating rinks in England at the time, where kind of high society mingled and where figure skating really took off. And Princess was kind of one of the main ones, and it was open from. Um, it opened in 1896, and then it closed during the First World War, World War and it was used by the Red Cross for storage. And um, at the at the club, ice dancing was really popular, and they really viewed, um, they called waltzing, valsing, kind of like from the European. And, um, and they would hold these dance competitions where people would waltz around chairs that were in the middle of the ice. Uh, which is, and then they would go the other way, and that's what they did. Um, but they, but it was almost like a dance because people would constantly. Um, it's not like you picked a nice dance partner and you stuck with them. Uh, you would switch partners, almost like you know, like like a dance card at a ball, or something back then. And um, ice, they were crazy yeah. about crazy about ice dancing. 
Do you know what's so much fun? Even when I was a kid, um, they used to have dance sessions mm -hmm. with live orchestras, uh, mm -hmm. you know, smaller orchestras. But that was a big thing. And um, you're right. You didn't dance with the same person all of the time. And as sort of like a very young dancer, um, they uh, I often would get drafted into service so that I could help sort of um, uh, ferry people around. Um, <laughs> but it was just it was very reminiscent of another time. I mean, my grandmother used to talk about tea dances back and sort of like the 20s and 30s, uh, mm -hmm. the 20s more so, uh, where, you know, you would go in the afternoon to the Royal York Hotel in Toronto, actually. And there was an orchestra and there was a dance. And um, it's how young people met. No tindering then, I'll tell you. <laughs> no. A little bit before that. A little bit. So the other thing that maybe people don't know about is in that time, there was a lot of royal attention to figure skating. Like when I, when I read your blog, I was fascinated um, that this was this was a, a, a an activity that had the attention of the royals. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah. So King King Edward uh, the seventh, who was the king at the time, before he was uh, before he was king, he was a patron of the National Skating Association in England. And um, and when they had in 1898, that was the, uh, right before this period. That was the first time that the World Championships were held in England, and they were held at the National Skating Palace. And the royal family all came. They all had their own box. And that was, it was a huge deal um, that the royals were there. And then in 1902, which was the same year um, that he, you know, that he became king, the world championships um, were held in England as well. And, um, and again, the royals all came. So it was very much, um, very much, uh, you know, a, a royalty and high society were all really involved with the skating rinks but an interesting part of that is that uh the woman who owned uh princess skating club at the time was the duchess of bedford and so she was you know high society and there's a really a really funny story about her that i shared um uh, in the piece that i did and so she was involved with an organization that was in line with the suffragette movement uh for, oh. for votes for one. And what happened was she got dinged with these tax charges um, for the ring that she didn't want to pay. So in order to in order to make the money to pay back her taxes, she sold one of the skating trophies at an auction and another one of the suffragettes decided to buy the trophy. Uh, so, and so that's, that's how they were able to get around it. So it, it was all high society that were, that were mingling, um, at these rinks and, you know, and, and royals attended and dukes and duchesses and lords and ladies. It's really, it's really very interesting. You know, I was starting to talk to you a little bit and then I'm sure Charlene's going to jump in with something. Um, we were talking, uh, before the broadcast started, big surprise people, um, <laughs> But one of the things that we wanted to talk about, or I wanted to talk about, is that in those days, ladies, um, and especially high society ladies, I thought were not particularly physical. So the fact that they would be figure skating um, or fancy skating or whatever you wanted to call it, um, in those long dresses that are difficult to negotiate with skates, having done it in a few carnivals myself, but, you know, they would have some of them gone ass over tea kettle, I'm sure, and had their skirts around their ears. Why did they risk it in those times? I, I think skate, skating was just a very fashionable, it was a fashionable activity that some, you know, that some woman would have turned into, you know, would have approached as a sport, the ones that were better at it. And, I, it, and there really was a difference between, you know, if you look at the pictures of, of what the people that were doing it, you know, more recreationally versus the ones that were doing it more competitively would wear. Um, there is a difference because right here we're seeing a picture of these are the kinds of, of dresses that women would have gone to go skate, worn to go skate a waltz at, at Princess Skating Club in Knightsbridge. But if you look at a picture of, um, of Madge Sires, who we're going to talk probably talk a little bit more about later, um, right here, yeah, she what she's wearing is far less extravagant than that. And she was one of the top female skaters of the time. And she was also one of the first women to say, hey, you know, we don't need to be 
tripping over our dresses and you know and we can tone it down a little bit if we want to if we want to take it seriously as a sport so she's someone that has to be has to be thanked for um you, you know for a lot of things in terms of uh the sports development of that time but fashion is one of them too Mm -hmm. You know, it's so interesting when we talk about her, um, I referred to her in my post as the Yuna Kim of her of her time. And she really was. She was like a legend. Charlene, I interrupted you. You go ahead. No, that's it. Uh, yeah, that, that's totally fine. Um, I was just going to say that it's interesting that the, the high society ladies that were doing more of the recreational skating as opposed to actually, you know, making a sport out of it. If you look back to the uh, image that you popped up, at the PJ, you can actually see some really traditional skirt lines and uh, really like flattering lines, which is something that is very um, characteristic of a lot of skating costumes. You know, people people sort of wander from the line. But if you look at the, the lady in the beige kind of, um, that skating skirt line just over the hip is such a classic look that still uh, exists today. And it's something that I actually use in a lot of my work. So that's really cool to see. That's awesome. It you know what's so interesting? When we talked to Doug Hall last week, he was talking about, um, even in today's world, with Mary Jane Stong, who, of course, is yeah. um, you know a leading dress designer, um, how the dress fits in the small yeah. of the back is yeah. one of the attention uh, to detail. Um, the, uh, but I'm still fascinated by the fact that um, um, they would have been struggling with all of those layers of fabric and trying to stay upright. So um, Ryan, tell me a little bit more about Madge. Let's get right into Madge, because that's why I love her name. Secondly, <laughs> who doesn't love that glide? That's amazing when you think about it. Outside, lots of bumps on the water and still, um, and able to keep her hat on. Tell me what you think about her. <laughs> so she's a really, really, really fascinating character for a lot of reasons. Um, so she took up, she took up skating um during uh, right around it like around uh right around the turn of the century just before that and she came from a very rich family um and shortly after she started skating her father had a her father was involved with with you know real estate development and he kind of he, the family had a bit of a like a financial downturn so they had to lay off some servants and they had to economize and you know move, move to a smaller move to a smaller house and around this time, she was she taken up skating, and she met her husband Edgar, who um, who also became her pairs partner. And you know they competed together and um, and won many skating competitions, and they won the bronze medal at the 1908 Olympics. And uh, Madge is Madge is one of those you know sporting women during that period who um, she, she didn't just excel at skating; she was also an accomplished swimmer. And uh, she competed in a clay pigeon shooting as well. So <laughs> I know there's all what kinds of crazy little tidbits here. Um, and the neat thing about Mad, she entered in uh, 1902. She entered uh, an application to compete in the World Championships, and there was no rule at the time saying that women couldn't compete. And uh, so she was allowed to compete and she finished second and there's a bit of a you know i don't want to say urban legend but there's you know there's kind of like a story that's been passed down um that the winner um ulrich Saukow, who invented the Saukow jump you know was so impressed with her that he gave her his gold medal and the interesting thing about that is like many years later, I think after his death, his wife was going through um, his trophies and medals and she found out that that medal was indeed missing. Oh, wow. So, so, so there might be some truth to that rumor. Um, and you know, it's interesting to note because in the history books, um, it, it's not just that it was a world figure skating championship, but it was a world figure skating men's championship. Mm -hmm. That was, um, so it wasn't like it was sort of a, a mixed, a mixed entry. She was the only woman um, in that event, um, which is quite remarkable. It is, but this is where things get a little bit interesting. So Madge did win. She won the very first Olympics um, in women's figure skating in 1908. And she won the first two world championships in women's skating in 1906 and 1907. But in between the time that she first competed at the world championships and the time that they held the first ISU championships for ladies, the world championships for men were held in Stockholm, Sweden. 
That's right. In 1905. And another woman um, from England entered that competition. Madge did not enter the women's event there. And another woman actually won. There was a women's competition that wasn't considered a world championship, but it was held at the world championships, if that makes, if that makes any sense. Because <laughs> that's how it was back then. It was very confusing. Um, but another British woman named Muriel, Muriel Harrison actually won that event. And she hasn't been remembered or recognized at all. Um, and that was, she was one skater who I wanted to highlight um, because her story is really interesting in itself. So both her and Madge um, were really important, um, really important women's figure skaters during that period and, and really uh, did a lot to help advance the sport um, for women. Um, you know, it's, um, it's fascinating to me to see that kind of, um, history sort of come out there. Um, mm -hmm. So you talk about it being for high society. Where do you know if if um, more? Um, I don't want to say normal, but you know, everyday people, if they were skating at that time. Well, yeah, I mean, they were skating on, they were skating on, you know, on ponds and rivers where they could. But admission to skating clubs was very, very choosy, and it was it was how much money you had, it was who you knew, and. A big part of it at that time, too, was that it was where the sport was developing and becoming um, and, and becoming more of, you know, the roots of what it is today. That was happening in Switzerland. And okay. It was really, very, very fashionable for people who had money to go to Switzerland in winter. So they would go and they go skiing or they go, you know, at, at Davos or St. Moritz and they, you know, they go skating and the top skaters of that time would meet in Switzerland and they'd share ideas and they talk about skating and they talk about how the sport would develop. Middle-class people would not, or, you know, or poorer people would not have had the money, uh, okay. uh, you know, just to go over to Switzerland on a whim um, and be part of that. It was, it was just a very exclusive kind of circle. Um, but they were still, uh, people of all classes were skating, um, but they wouldn't have had the exposure to figure skating. It would more just be, you know, recreational. It's amazing. Charlene, did you want to jump in with something? Yeah, I was going to say, we were talking, chatting before the show, and uh, we were talking about how that system with uh, the exclusivity of clubs still transcends into some places today. So maybe like yeah. the tr cricket or the granite club. Um, so Ryan, you were talking about how that's how it all started, really. It is how it all really started with those with those kind of very exclusive skating clubs at the turn of the century. And unfortunately, um, women, women weren't often allowed during that time period to be members of skating clubs they could attend, but they couldn't be a member unless they were, you know, accompanied by a gentleman or sponsored by a gentleman. And sometimes even that wasn't good enough, depending on what club it was. So... Right. Um, Skating, skating clubs back then were incredibly choosy and, um, and, and we're not kind to women, unfortunately. Well, it's just kind of the time. Time. <laughs> many, oh, people, many people weren't very kind to women. No, they so weren't. No, they weren't. That it lends to the fashion. Like PJ, you were talking about the skirt lengths. Like women weren't doing crazy things and, you know, fanning their legs over top of their heads. It just wouldn't have been a thing. So the, no. the trip factor probably would have been a lot less than you know, some of the, the tricks that are being performed today. I know, but even so, um, no, no like fanning, that's for sure, unless you were a certain kind of woman. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, now, were, do you know, Ryan, if there were shows back in the day? I know that in your blog, there are a couple of things, a couple of pictures that you have that were about skating carnivals. Can you tell me about skating shows? So when you want to talk about shows, there's a really, really interesting story Um that I talked about um, in the piece. And it's about a woman um, named Isabella Butler. And she was from uh, Chicago. And she toured, she was actually, she was completely unlike uh, these posh women that you would have seen um, in England. She skated in tiny little sport, short skirts um, because she was involved, she was kind of on the vaudeville circuit. And okay. she got her start doing, um, doing this thing called the dip of death, like on an automobile in the Barnum, in the Barnum circus. And she actually toured during this time period on a little doing shows on a little tiny tank of ice with her pair's partner. 
um, Eddie Bassett, who was a competitive skater in, in the States uh, during that time period. And they were Butler and Bassett, and they toured um, the States doing uh, shows on little, on tank ice. And that's like, her story is kind of the, um, it's the complete opposite of, you know, the stories of a lot of the competitive skaters during that period. But she wasn't allowed to compete because she actually applied to compete um, at the Championships of America, which predated like the US Championships um, during this time period. And her application was refused. And the man that was behind refusing her application was the same man that was um, behind keeping women out of the swimming and diving events. Oh, the- convenient. That's good. Very convenient. So what, what was his rationale? It wasn't ladylike or what was it the it was uh, It was unladylike for a woman to be competing for prizes. It was fine if they wanted to compete, but it was just, you know, it, a, a woman wanting to compete against other people, you know, that's, it's fine if they want to participate, but not compete. That's just awful. Just and unseemly somehow. Unseemly. And then he went on, if, if you read like the article about his rationale, and I have that somewhere about his rationale behind his views, you're just reading and going, what, what, you know, but it was, the, it was the mentality of the time, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. One of the other things I wanted to ask you about is speaking of the mentality of the at the time, with very rare exceptions, Clara Hughes being one of them, um, you don't see um, um, people at the highest level of sport competing with success. Like, what did you say? Pigeon shooting or clay shooting or something? Clay pigeon. Uh, yeah. At, the high, at the highest level of success in other sports. What was different about that day and this? I think back then, I mean, these were the times, I mean, where, I mean, women who were competing certainly at, in skating at that time period, they came from really privileged, privileged upbringings. Yeah. So, you know, they would have had governesses and they would have been encouraged to, you know, to, to, you have to learn how to play the piano and you have to learn how to do this and you have to learn how to yep. do that. And they would, and if they showed any degree of proficiency in anything, they would take it up for a while, perhaps, and then they try something else. But almost all uh, of the top women's figure skaters during the Edwardian, Edwardian era, they, they participated in a summer sport as well. Um, so Madge wasn't the only one. Like um, Dorothy Greenhouse Smith, who we might talk about later, she um, there she is. Yeah, so she was the she was the first woman to do an axle jump. She also competed in Wimbledon in tennis. Oh my goodness! Yeah, really? and, Mar- and Muriel Harrison, who I talked about earlier, who won, you know that that first. Uh, well, she really was a world champion, although she wasn't recognized as one. Um, mm-hmm. She played the piano. She competed in boating regattas. You know what I mean? So. These were women that were extremely talented women who dabbled in in sports other than skating, and, and they all had success. So I think it just all had to do with their class. Mm-hmm. The um, I you know we're we're getting some lots of people are interested sort of in this topic and in listening about sort of what was what um, was this sport. My my mom, who was a former national judge, used to talk about people would say, "Well, if Barbara Ann Scott were skating today, would she win?" Yes, because she had the heart of a champion you know, tech, uh, technique and, and whatever else evolves, but had she been born into this day and age, for sure she would have been competitive. What were the elements that made, let's say, a Madge Sires competitive in her day? I love her hat, by the way. What do you think about the hat, Charlene? Oh yeah, it's a keeper for sure. <laughs> How do you keep that on when you're skating? But anyway, it's a story for, especially spinning, you know what I mean? Lay back. <laughs> I think, well, it was during this period that the value of figures actually got decreased. So, oh. um, in 1905, I think they were like 75 or 77 percent. That's how much figures counted for. And then they brought them down to 60. Wow. So 60 percent figures, 40 percent free skating. So really, for the first half of this period, I mean, you, you it, it really it, you had to be a good school figure skater. Um, and you certainly did um, for the entire period because it counted for 60 percent. Um I was actually just to kind of dive off topic for just a second, um, but it does pertain to this. Um, the way free skating was viewed at that point in time is not the way that we look at things today. 
Um, I was reading an article uh, from the World War II era, um, just before Barbara Ann Scott was competing, where a judge was talking about, you know, how, and this was an international judge, and they were saying, well, I don't think we should be comparing um, the difficulty of different jumps, because that seems like kind of a waste of time. And that was his attitude. So, huh. you know, he just thought, well, if they did, we should be looking at how well they do them and whether or not they're doing doubles or singles. So the attitude that we have towards jumping today, if it didn't apply in the 1940s, it didn't. It certainly didn't apply um, in the 1900s. So what, what judges would have been looking for in a skater's free skating would have been it would have been grace. It would have been interesting steps. It would have been, you know, um, interesting figures that were weaved into their free skating performance. But they just, they looked at, at free skating through a different lens than we do today. And jumps really didn't factor that much into it. And certainly not their difficulty. So they were looking at them to do a free dance. They wanted a free dance. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> a solo free dance. A solo free dance. Yeah. Yeah. Charlene, what do you when you look back at these old pictures? Um, you know, what what do you see? What what sort of things jump out at you? Um, I think what I see is like a, a glimpse back to a time when skating was so much more of a casual, um, recreational, enjoyed situation. So um, we're talking about, you know, wealthy individuals who were like, OK, sure, great. I'll sign up for the world championships. No problem. Whereas, you know, skaters today are, are committing their lives to trying to make it to the world championship. So it's interesting because I think in my mind, I mean, I wasn't there. Ryan, you probably can speak to this. but at that time, it seems like it was way more of a cool thing to be doing for everyone, whether you were at the world championships or, you know, just skating on a pond. And I think we're seeing glimpses of that this winter, especially with everything locked down. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, yeah. one of the things that I think is so interesting about all of it is the fact that, um, um, and this goes back even to, and I'm way older than both of you, you know, I go back to a time where it wasn't whether you won or lost it was about doing your best and working hard and i think that you know there's been a lot of pressure placed on on younger people now that they have to win at all costs so i just see some of these pioneers in the sport as doing it for the love of the sport but also just applying sort of a hard you know a, a hard one um, work ethic and um, dedication to technique and dedication to just the success was in um, the success was in the doing, not in the winning. I don't know. What do you think about that, Ryan? I think that I think that what you're saying is is, is very much accurate, um, but there are exceptions to it. Um, and there's one that I really think needs to be mentioned, and that's there was one skater during this period who very much took it seriously um, in, in terms of in, in terms of having a competitive attitude and wasn't always the most gracious about it. And that man was uh, was Ulrich Saukow, who uh, who won 10 world championships, won the first Olympic gold medal, and he won nine European championships. And he's most remembered for inventing the Saukow jump, but he was actually probably a lot better at figures than he was free skating. But the story about him being um, him being super competitive and um, not always and taking it perhaps a little too serious sometimes uh, happened at the very first Olympics. And there was the two top contenders for the title were him and a Russian skater named Nikolai Panin Kolomekin. And during the figures, um, Ulrich Saukow was actually yelling insults at him while he was trying to do his figures. <laughs> and there ended up being, there ended up being like a big fight between the two men. And, and, uh, the Russian skater pulled out of the men's event and Saukow pulled out of the special figures event, which was a separate category. And the official story um, that kind of got released in the papers was that they were, oh, they're both sick. That's why they can't compete in, in the events that each other are competing in. But the events were actually held like within, within like a day of each other. So that's a little bit of a coincidence. So 
Um, and there are other stories about Sao Cao as well, not being um, not being very gracious um, whenever he even came close to losing. So um, there were skaters back then, um, and they were the exception, not the rule, who took it, de- you know, dread- deathly, um, or dreadfully seriously, and he was one of them. Was there any financial gain to being a world champion or an Olympic champion in those days? No. Um, Just for the... I mean, you weren't going on... The ice capades and the arc and the ice follies weren't around yet. Um, not even close. So you weren't going on to that. If you wanted to be a if you wanted to be a skating coach, well, we all know that you know that's not the ticket to that's not the ticket to um to be um, <laughs> but if they wanted to do that, they could have just done it. Um and they could have they could have easily um not competed um and chose to give lessons in the stand and, and probably made a pretty penny doing it because everybody involved was for the most part wealthy. So Mm -hmm. there was nothing to gain uh, financially from, from competing back then. Any social cred? Like I'd like you to meet my friend who's just won the, like at a dinner party, did it have a certain cachet or did it uh, gain you entree into things? I wonder. I think it certainly, uh, I think it helped get, help some skaters gain entry to higher social circles because, um, if you think about it, I mean, some of these, some of these skaters that were competing were um, were very wealthy and, and, and well connected. Some of them might have come from well-to-do families, but they weren't personally um, very, um, you know, high up in the social standings. And the sires, like imagine Edgar Sires, they both came from wealthy families, but they themselves weren't, you know, rolling in the dough. And yet, the, yet they were able to attend a, a lot of very um, high class social functions. And I think that their skating had something to do with that. Mm-hmm. I actually you know, think that it transcends into today as well. Like if um, any athlete, I'm sure we could pick any sport um, of, of someone who's coming from a non wealthy, regular Joe Blow background, and then yeah. they become very famous in their sport or even as a musician or something like that. That still exists today, so I'm I'm seeing a trend here. I'm seeing that skating drama has has origin. I'm seeing that <laughs> it has an origin. Some fashion has an origin, and these things still live on today. <laughs> they do. There's what definitely that evolution there. Mm-hmm. What were you saying, Charlene? I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I, I was missed actually you. saying what were you saying, madam? <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say that if you were to describe the Edwardian era in terms of figure skating, what what would you say about it? I think that the I think that the key things to keep in mind is that this is the time period where it began, where skating began its kind of metaf- metamorphosis from a pastime to a sport. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the time period where women's and pair skating both really took off because they became their own categories of the world championships. Before that, it was just men's single skating. And most importantly, it's the time that what they called the continental style of skating, which is really the style of skating that we that we see today, um, okay. became the defining style of the sport. Because prior to that and during that period, there were really two different styles of skating. There was continental style skating and there was English style skating. And English style skating, I, I don't, you know, I don't know if there's a lot of um, videos out there, but if you look at it, if you search for it on YouTube, you might be able to find some. And they, it's very, very, it's a completely different style of even carrying your body. And you've got your arms at your waist, and you're completely upright and stiff. You're not bending your knee. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the style of skating that was in vogue during the Victorian period, and it was really through um, skaters you know, going to Switzerland um, and exchanging ideas that this style, the the continental style or the style that we see today kind of took off around the world. You know, what's so interesting? I was trying to go back, you know, when we were talking about an old time of uh, figure skating, I was trying to go back to an article that I wrote with Mel Matthews about Sheldon Galbraith. And I, it's on your blog, which is fantastic. So I'm going to put the link in the comments so people want to go back to Sheldon Galbraith. Because as I did research awesome for that blog, it was fascinating. Like when he was talking about, you know, um, wearing and and Salco is wearing um, 
uh, leggings like this as well. Um, you know, woolen leggings in, in order to skate outdoors, in order to do all the rest of it. It just was quite a different time. Um, what were the biggest challenges, do you think, of skating in that time? Oh, my gosh. Like, I've read so many and, and heard so many horror stories from skaters that competed outdoors, you know, in, in the elements as to what they actually had to face. I mean, North American skaters during that time period, you know, they were known when they went over to Europe, they used to call them hothouse skaters because they were used to skating. Okay. And skaters that, and that was a big part of the reason why people would spend time in Switzerland as well, because they could get used to skating in all different weather conditions. Yep. And there are stories of, of European and world championships dating right up until like the fifties where skaters were competing, you know, in snowstorms, in <laughs> Um, pouring rain in temperatures that were like absolutely insane, like in wind chill. And I, I, I mean, I remember there was a story one time, um, Francis Defo, who competed, um, who won the world championships. They one time when they, they competed, I think it was one of the times when they won the world championships, it was so cold that when she got off the ice, one of the other skaters had to give her like a shot of brandy or something, just, you know, just so she could handle it. Which sounds like a good time as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, we've got a great question from John, who wants to know, did John Curry do a gala where he skated in that old Ingr English rink? I'm imagining that we're talking about um, uh, <clears throat> the Prince's I Ice Palace, was it called? I'm sorry, I've forgotten it. Prince's oh, Skating oh. Club. Princess Skating Club. No, no, that that rink was that rink was long gone and demolished. John Curry did do a he did a program that was kind of inspired by like the old English style, where I think oh. he where I think he dressed you know kind of dressed like you know like, uh, someone would have you know what someone would have worn back maybe during Victorian times or Edwardian times. Like no, I don't quite remember the program, but I remember seeing it at one point and thinking that it was really pretty. But yeah, he did do a kind of an old style program at one point. Um. Uh, Charlene, did you want to talk about the costumes at all? Um, I think there's something to be said for maybe we should bring some of these things back, minus the long skirts. Um, the the image that you have of uh, Mr. Saukow, um, great outfit. You had mentioned the tights. That's something that I think some skaters um, that are uh, males or male identifying try to bring that back. And they, I think, historically have gotten a lot of slack for that. But it turns out that that was a cool thing 100 years ago. So maybe we that was the thing 100 years ago. And yeah. I, do you know what? I think they should bring back the fabulous hats, too, because that was the best part about the Edwardian era. They had these gorgeous hats with ridiculous. <laughs> they had feathers and everything. Um, and uh, that would be fabulous. I'd, lo I'd love to see an Edwardian inspired free dance, a Downton Abbey free dance. That would give me a lot of joy. That would be a lot of fun. And yeah. so for anyone watching, if you do it, it needs to be dedicated to Ryan. <laughs> oh, I would, I would watch the hell out of that. I honestly would. I would love it. <laughs> but I just like, I love the silhouettes of all of their outfits. Like, yeah. just like um, very structured. I love the the collars and the, the cute little gloves that match. Um, just the, the attention to detail and like the, obviously they were wearing some beautiful garments. They were very well-to-do people. So I love that. What do you think? Well, I think that the fabrics, though, would they not have been? I mean, you're the one you're the one with the experience with costumes. But I would think that those fabrics were hard to deal with. I mean, they would have been wools, mostly wool and maybe um, some silk here and there. Uh, I, would, I would I would guess so. But I don't think that those people were doing anything that they really again. No high fan kicks. So we didn't need anything yeah. too, too stretchy. Um, I think, honestly, they were just trying to stay warm, especially for the those that were skating outside. Stay warm and stay alive. Those are the, yeah. those are the two focuses. Um, so, Ryan, let's talk a little bit again about um, uh, some of the juicier stories. You've got so many of them. What are some of the ones that just sort of jump to your mind? Give us the drama. Juicy right? stories. Oh, I've got a million. Um, let me see. So... I know I have, I made a note of a couple here that I wanted to share. So great. Um, I'm already so, a fan of the sow cow drama. That was good. Oh, the sow cow drama was I pretty love good. love that. <laughs> so here's some other drama. So uh, th this is more, um, and this is just really interesting. So Muriel Harrison, who I talked about earlier, who won that, you know, first unofficial world championships. So she went on and after winning that, she won an international competition for women. Um, in St. Moritz. 
and then she gave up the sport competitively and she still continued to skate recreationally a little bit, but she didn't pursue skating um, seriously anymore after that because she got married to a very, very interesting char character. Um, she got married to a man named Stavely Bulford, which is like a very, oh, a good name. very Edwardian, you know, kind of name. And he was an author who wrote books on the occult. And oh. he was very famous um, at, at, during the uh, 1920s, during the Roaring Twenties, for he wrote all of these papers and books about taking photographs of ghosts. And uh, apparently uh, Muriel was really into this too. So they were, and they, so they lived on a farm. They were ridiculously rich and they were really into ghost hunting. So that's kind of a crazy story. I'm not as crazy as the name Stavely. Stavely, I know. I know. There's something very like to do about it, Stavely. There is. There is. We're going to Stavely and Muriel's for cocktails. I know. I love exactly. that. There for might be mixed in, but we'll be there. Yeah. Yeah. A great question that's coming in from Fraser. Um, and it's specifically about Ulrich. Can you see it or do you want me to read it to you? Wondering about if Salkow's issues with Pannon came down to Pannon having defeated him at the Pension Memorial. That very well could have been the case. So one of like one of, if not the only times that that Sal Cow got beat was the was I think earlier in the year. I want to say maybe January and February because the Olympics in 1908 were that fall. Yeah, uh, Sal Cow got beat by Nikolai Pan and Kolomenkin at that championships, and I'm sure that there probably was. I'm sure there probably was some sour grapes. So I think that's a great point. I, I think that he hit the nail on the head there. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? I got another great question from MK. Hey, MK. Um, thank you for joining us. How has the athleticism of skaters evolved over time? Are their qualities more important today versus the past? Good question. That's a big question. Yeah. Um, how has the athleticism evolved? Well, I mean, obviously back then, I mean, this is the time period where they were just starting to include axles in their programs. Um, I don't think that the Lutz wasn't even a thing yet because the guy who invented that um wasn't even on wasn't even on the scene uh yeah as of that point uh i think that it was really during um it was really during the war years and just after the war um that the jumping really you know became people started to take you know double double axles and triple drunk triple jumps um more seriously and, and dick button played a huge part in that by doing the first double axle and the first triple loop and then then came the triple toe loop um, in the early 1960s. And, you know, so um, I, I think it was just after the war that athleticism started being taken more, you know, the, the difficulty of jumps started being uh, started being taken more seriously. I think that there was a certain amount of athleticism in a corset trying to get your skates laced. I'm just saying. I I'm out of breath thinking about it. Well, and you know what's funny too? Like we think about, when, uh, coming back to the fashion for a second, like we, you know, when we think about going to a skating competition, like if you're going to go compete, you know, you go into the dressing room, you put on your costume, you do your makeup, you do, you know, you do your hair. Back then, they weren't, they weren't roll, they weren't, you know, str str strutting into the rink with a rolly bag coming behind them. That, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, they might have had a lady's maid with them, but that would have been their only, you know, that would have been their only help. They, they were already coming, they were, they already came to the rink dressed to skate. Mm -hmm. And I and I and I hardly think that they were probably that worried about their makeup, you know. So well, actually, back in the day, there wouldn't have been much makeup. There would have been a little bit of rouge, maybe, or just pinching your cheeks to give you some color. And there would have been lipstick. That, that's Charlene. Can you demonstrate that again? I think people need to see that on the big screen. We call this a little slap. <laughs> that might um, up. But there would have been, you know, maybe lipstick. But you know, it's funny. I'll tell you a funny story. A little bit to do with fashion. My grandmother, who was born in 1905, and met my grandfather sort of in the roaring 20s. My grandfather um, dated a lady who had a little bit of um, like embroidery on her ankle or at the back of her heel of her stocking or something, which was considered quite scandalous. Oh, yes. And oh, yes. My grandfather broke up with her as a result. So um, there were some very strict, you know, um, uh, rules about sort of what you wore. And as I said, when she got off the streetcar with my grandfather and he saw this little sort of detail on the back of her stocking, he was just 
horrified. Well, think it about it. It's that degree of horror that either my parents, my mother, and his sister or us ever ended up being here. But that's a story for a different day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, back then, lips, even wearing lipstick would have been like, you know, a, a bit fast. It would have been a bit fast. They would have, they would have had, people would have had something to say about that. Mm hmm. Certainly something to say about that. So there was a little bit of, um, um, you know, and even even there was a bit of scandal about pierced ears. It was considered very European. Yeah. Um, so if you were sort of a, a, a Protestant girl from, um, you know, Toronto, if you were wearing pierced ears, it was a tiny bit um, uh, exotic. That would be the best word to describe it. So yeah. if, fashion is funny when I think about some of the things that oh, have gone on. Changed. What's that? <laughs> I said, oh, how times have changed. I know. Yes. <laughs> but, but I even, remember. Even with skating, like today, skaters are expected to, to be very, you know, like put together and very like, clean. like this would not fly in a competitive no, no. situation. No. I had to wait and, until after for that. But it, you, it's it's interesting because I still see a lot of sub parallels that still exist. Maybe oh, not absolutely. with the lyrics. Absolutely. And I mean it. I think it's gotten a, it's gotten a little bit better, but it hasn't. It's still not there yet, you know. Well, I don't think it's ever going to be there because I, I think that people's ideas about other people, the way that we are are put together as humans, we're very much an us and them. So if you're us, you don't wear stockings that have a little something at the heel because that's considered fast. That's something that them does. You know what I mean? So. Oh. <laughs> Over time, um, you know, it would have been if figure skating was fashionable for ladies. Well, you know, I go back to even equestrian stuff and ladies riding side saddle. Mm -hmm. You know how hard it is to ride side saddle? Like, why did they ever think that that was a good idea or safer? I mean, I know why they thought it, but just, just crazy. Okay, so back to the juicy stories. Do you have any more for us? I don't know about juicy, but uh, I have a really cute one. So, okay. Princess <laughs> Skating Club, which we talked about earlier, they... The way that they resurfaced the rice, I mean, obviously they did it the old fashioned way with flooding, but they had a, they had a pony in a cart. They didn't have a Zamboni. <laughs> they had a little pony named Tam. And so they, they get Tam to come out and he'd pull the little thing across and dump the buckets of water out. And that was, you know, and people would get out there with their shovels so that, or whatever, or squeegees, whatever they called yeah, squeegees back then. Can we bring yeah. that back? Pardon me? Can we bring that back? That'd be so cute. I would love that. I, I, I think there should be animals everywhere in every like, aspect of figure skating. So like having ice patchers is fun and games, but like a pony? Everyone I know, I know, I know. Why did yeah. we lose the pony? That's what I would like to know. And I, I mean, I think there's some logistics, but we could work around that. I agree. Well, could you work around the pony piles if there were any during the floods? That's all I'm gonna say. Well, that would be terrible. That's why we bring back the Edwardian servants. Um <laughs> Help, I think is the word we're talking about now. Help, the downstairs yeah. people, as oh. we like to say, in the upstairs, yeah. downstairs world. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit before, because I, I know that time's running a little bit short, but if people were going to read this Edwardian blog, what kind of message do you want them to take away from them about skating in that time? I think that I, I, I'd like people to just, to kind of understand it in the, to kind of look at it for the time period that it was rather than to try to compare it to today. Okay. And to somehow look at it as inferior. I think that, I think what kind of breaks my heart a little bit with some people that don't perhaps have the same interest in skating history that I do. I, you know, it breaks my heart a little bit when people look at, look at times past and they go, Oh, well, they weren't doing, they were only doing singles back then. What a joke that was. Well, they didn't know what triple jumps were back then. They didn't have the skates to do them in. Right. They didn't have the coaches that were teaching them how to do these things. For the time period that these people were skating, what they were doing was actually quite remarkable. And I think that if you're able to under, to kind of gain an appreciation for the time and, and gain an appreciation for the resources that these people had available to them, I, I think that these were remarkable athletes in their own in their own respect. And I think that I just like people to kind of appreciate um, how talented these people really were, and, and that and the number of jump, the number of rotations that they did in the, did in the air plays no relevance to that. The fact that they were able to get airborne at all, huh. well, yeah. and the equipment they were using. We're not talking about a two thousand dollar boot or blade here, folks. 
We're talking or even about- anything that's that firm. It was like a shoe. Yeah. Been very, We're very talking- very- a hundred years ago, that's not what was happening. So the fact that they were doing that in itself with that equipment is its own miracle. It right? is. It really, yeah. really is. I've got to give you the comment of the day, which belongs to Moira uh, Van de Vuren, uh, a Zamponi. <laughs> Zamponi. I love it. Oh my God. That's awesome. Here is another great comment from Christine Love. Pony paws were pucks. <laughs> oh my. Donna like- loves the pony idea, and she says that also figure skating has always been a classy affair. That's true. Some of the people have been a little less than classy, um, but um, wow. but still, it's kind of it's kind of cool. You're getting kudos for your site from Buford oh, Skip and Husker, and um, here's a great one. And I agree from Natalia Ryan thank thank for your you. amazing blog. So many cool things to word, but Zamponi. Honestly, oh, Moira, that is genius. It. That is the genius. word of the day and maybe the word of 2020, Zam. Hashtag Zamponi. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> anyway, it's so much fun. Um, if people want to learn more about figure skating and its history, when is your next blog coming up and what kinds of subjects do you already have there? Okay, so I've got, um, I have, I put out two blogs a week, so every Tuesday and Thursday. Um I have, I've been doing this since 2013, so I have all kinds of topics, like skater biographies, um, events, shows, you know, who did the first this, who did the first that, there's, there's a lot of everything, you can just search it all, um, and I've got some neat stuff coming in 2021, my next project is I'm going to be looking at who coached every single uh, Olympic and world champion, so that's my, oh, will that's you come back and, thing, that's will you come back and do I'm another one? Of these, with when you get that all organized, will you do another one of these? Oh, I'll always do another one of these. Yeah, absolutely. It's fun. I love it. So much you fun to be here. able to talk about skating. Pardon me, Charlene. I said you heard it here. He can't go back on his word. Everyone witnessed it. No, he. It's, <laughs> it's recorded. It's recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to just go around the room and say everybody's hopes as we sign off for hopes for 2021. You get to go first, Charlene. Okay, my hopes for 2021. I would love to enter an ice rink um, without a mask on. That is my hope for 2021. I am hoping for um, continued good health for everybody in my house and yours. um, And that we just sort of continue to be patient. And we're all going to get through this, I think. What about you, Ryan? Just health and happiness and, um, and a lot of patience. I think that that's what I think that's what we all need right now. And just to take things one day at a time. That's because it's not going to miraculously get better when no. the bell drops. But let's hope, no. let's hope, you know, six months from now, uh, things are a little more positive. Well, the cool thing is, is that we will be on the right side of the clock when 2021 hits. So we're uh, we're on the getting up, getting improving. Hopefully, that's what I'm hoping for. So, Ryan, I just cannot thank you enough for joining us today. This has been so much fun for skating nerds like uh, Charlene and myself. Uh, the fact that you've got all this information out there is just spectacular. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're oh, thank you. It was fun. You are amazing. Well, everybody, that wraps up another episode of Blade This. I'd like to ask you to please um, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please follow Ryan and subscribe to his YouTube channel and follow his blog. Same with Charlene. She's all over Instagram. Um, And we'll see you next time. Thank you again. Bye for now.